All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Kyle Learman. I run the uh, Champions of Change program here at the White House. Really excited to have all of you here today. And I am just going to go ahead and turn it over to our first speaker. We're incredibly lucky to have Cecilia Munoz, who is the director of the Domestic Policy Council. Thank you, Kyle. Good afternoon, everybody. Good Welcome to the White House. Um, I've been looking forward to this all day. This is really um, just, this is a highlight for me. I've been so excited that you're here and so excited to meet you and to be part of this event today. But I really should start by um, thanking the fabulous Barbara Poppy, the executive director um, of our homelessness work for everything that she does. She is extraordinary. So um, I get to be the first one to thank our amazing champions of change, uh, people who have dedicated their careers to creating solutions to child and youth homelessness. Um, I have such tremendous admiration for the work that each of you do on the ground each and every day to support these vulnerable young people. It is tremendously, tremendously important. It feels to me like a foundational thing um, with respect to who we are as a country. And so I've just, I'm very excited to be here to say thank you. Um, uh, the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness, thanks to, as I said, uh, uh, Barbara's leadership, as well as the leadership of Secretary Sebelius, Secretary Donovan, Secretary Shinseki, among many others, has been um, very successful in developing and beginning to implement the first cohesive federal plan to finally end homelessness in this country. They and today's champions continue to act on what I know President Obama understands very deeply. No child, no youth, no parent, no American, nobody should be homeless in this country. And while we're making positive gains, such as dramatically curbing homelessness among veterans, we know there's a lot more that we have to do together to address the problem. In particular, today's champions exemplify the spirit of collaboration, innovation, and unwavering commitment needed to end child and youth homelessness by 2020. Child and youth homelessness is an unacceptable reality that really touches the core of who we are. And so many of the issues that we work on, poverty, family violence, juvenile justice, child trafficking, disconnected youth, the list goes on and on, intersect and reinforce one another in ways that we wish they didn't. So while we need to know more about the barriers that our young people and families with children are facing, we already know that solving this problem requires us to push ourselves to build systems and policies that meet their needs. We need to do better at integrating our multiple systems to more effectively address the unique needs of homeless children and youth. We need to invest in research to identify effective intervention models for the continuum of child and youth homelessness. We need to leverage the expertise and resources of partners like our champions to help scale up promising approaches. Solving the problem requires leadership, vision, commitment, and working across invisible lines and subject matter barriers. Solving the problem requires collaboration, flexibility, and innovation at the federal, state, and local level. And most of all, it requires lifting up and learning from people like the champions we're honoring today. We are so grateful for today's champions, both for sharing their stories with us today but more so for the life-changing services that they provide to our children and young people every day. Um, we rely so much on um, the experience and expertise of people like them, but people like all of you, in order to do our work well. Uh, I was, before coming into the administration, this is my first stint in government, I was at an organization called the National Council of La Raza for 20 years. Um, I uh, understand and believe in and really have dedicated my life to what nonprofits can do to make this country a better place. And it is a source of great pride to me that I work in an administration that understands that very deeply. And we understand that we've got limited time here in government, and that if we're going to be successful in doing the ambitious things that uh, caused the boss to run for office, we have to do them in partnership with you. We have to know what you know, see the world as you see it and understand it, and make sure we're learning the lessons that you were there to help teach us if we're going to be effective. Um, this is why today is a highlight of my day. This is such important work that you do. And uh, the, these champions of change are, um, are real heroes. So thank you to our champions. Thank you to Barbara. Thank you to all of you for being here. Uh, and now, on to Barbara.
good afternoon. I really want to thank Cecilia for her partnership with us. It's just been fantastic. She is our contact to the White House and to the President, and she's been a tremendous leader in her time with the administration, so thank you. I also at this time want to go ahead and welcome our champions, so if they would go ahead and come in, it'd be great. Good afternoon and welcome to everyone who has joined us today. So many of you in this room could also be up here on stage and so I applaud the work that you're doing in the community. Um, I am Barbara Poppy, the Executive Director of the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness and I get the pleasure to be your MC for today. And I'm very excited about the opportunity to celebrate the work of men and women who are dedicated to the fight to end youth and child homelessness in across our country. And I especially want to make a special welcome to, we have two members of Congress who've joined us today, and I want to thank Representative Judy Biggert and Representative Jan Schakowsky for joining us. They're both from Illinois, so thank them. I also want to thank all of the folks here at the White House who've helped to us to convene this important event. And I especially want to thank the 13 champions of change um, for all of the work that you've done and your willingness to be with us today and to let us honor you. This June marked the second anniversary of the launch of Opening Doors, the first ever federal strategic plan to prevent and end homelessness. Opening Doors is grounded in the vision articulated by President Obama that it is simply unacceptable for individuals, children, families, and our nation's veterans to be faced with homelessness in our country. And over the last two years, our federal partners have worked diligently to align their collective resources, and they've sought out the evidence-based practices in an attempt to meet the four bold and measurable goals that are set out in opening doors. The first two are finish the job of ending chronic and veterans homelessness by 2015. Over the past year, we have seen a remarkable 12% reduction in veterans homelessness due to the strong bipartisan support and the strategic investment of resources. The third goal is to prevent and end homelessness for families, youth, and children by 2020, and finally, to set a path to ending all types of homelessness. There is much work to be done, in particular for families, youth, and children. We know that the proportion of homeless youth and children has been on the rise over the last decade, and too often the face of homelessness is a child. Ending youth homelessness will require more collaboration, flexibility and innovation at the federal, state, and local level. It will also require a systemic approach to services and housing options and scaling up the best practices that employ both targeted solutions and mainstream systems. With these principles in mind, the Council, under the leadership of HHS Secretary Kathleen Sebelius, embraced a new framework toward ending youth homelessness by 2020 at its June Council meeting. Ending homelessness among families with children will require continued improvement in the economy, as well as the kinds of investment that President Obama is making in the American people, like those that create opportunities for parents to get back to work and keep money in their pockets so they can provide the financial support necessary to meet their children's needs. Ending homelessness among families and children will also require that mainstream and homeless programs implement the best practices, like those that were launched under the Recovery Act's Homelessness Prevention and Rapid Rehousing Program, HPRP. We commend Education, HUD, and HHS for leading the fight to end child and youth homelessness for this administration. But today we are here to honor 13 men and women who are champions of change in the fight against child and youth homelessness across the country. These individuals exemplifying the spirit of collaboration and possessing a commitment to diversity demonstrate the innovative strategies coupled with an unwavering commitment that have shown that we can produce measurable results when we serve children and youth who experience homelessness in their communities. For these reasons, we honor you, our champions of change, for the work they do every day to prevent and end homelessness. Now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce the Secretary for the Department of Housing and Urban Development 
and previous chairperson of the council, and a vital member in our, our work here at the council. And uh, under his leadership, he helped us shepherd through the federal plan to prevent and end homelessness. So please join me in wel welcoming Secretary Sean Donovan. Thank you all for joining us here today. And uh, I want to say a special thank you, obviously, to my good friend and partner, Barbara Poppy, who is a, just a wonderful, wonderful inspiration to all of us in the work that she does. Um, I want to say a special thank you and welcome to two special champions of change that we have here uh, today with us, uh, two Congress people who have been great fighters uh, on this issue, uh, incredible champions uh, around homelessness, and really showing the bipartisan nature of the work that we've been doing on homelessness. So please uh, give a warm welcome to two uh, Congress people that come from uh, very close to each other in districts in Illinois, uh, Judy Biggert, uh, as well as Jan Schakowsky that are here. Thank you. Now, when I think about the work that we've done uh, with all of the champions that are here today, with Barbara, uh, with uh, our Congress, you know, it reminds me of the days I started working in homelessness uh, as a volunteer in a homeless shelter in college, and then at my very first job out of college at the National Coalition for the Homeless as an intern here in Washington, D.C. Um, and those decades ago, most Americans thought some people would always be homeless. That for some, there was simply nothing that we could do. And so many people had given up hope. Flash forward to today, and you find that not only are communities across the country working together to solve this problem, but that 19 agencies in the federal government are working hand in hand to help make it possible. I'm proud to work for a president that put in place the first ever federal strategic plan to end homelessness. But let's be clear, opening doors didn't start here in Washington. The federal government didn't just wake up one day and decide that the country could end or would end homelessness. It was only possible because people, the people uh, that we honor today as champions of change and so many of you here in our audience joining us today. Because you did and our champions did, by the time the president took office, we'd already reduced chronic homelessness by a third in just five years. Because of what you all have done, we've built on that progress and helped one in five homeless veterans get off the streets in one year. Still, we honor these champions of change here today, all 13 of them, not simply for the progress we've made, but for the innovations that they've forged at the local level to solve one of the most challenging and tragic forms of homelessness, homelessness among America's young people. Certainly, this audience understands that many young people are homeless for a simple reason, because their family is homeless. For so many of these families, the Recovery Act's Homeless Prevention and Rapid Rehousing Program was a remarkable blessing. In fact, of the more than 1.2 million people for whom this program prevented or ended homelessness, over 75% were in families with children. Half of those served with HPRP funds in the first year of the program alone were children. HPRP proved that providing families with short-term assistance from rent and basic case management services to something as simple as a security deposit or a utility payment, one utility payment, could make the difference in helping a family get back on their feet. Remarkably, cities are reporting that 90% of the families who received rapid rehousing assistance through HPRP remain housed today. Remarkable showing. 
Still, you also know that on any given night, thousands of unaccompanied young people are homeless. These are young people without families or separated from their families, many of whom have run away from home and are living on our streets in cars, in shelters, in terrible places for anyone to live, much less a child. Others have aged out of foster care, which is to say that they're too old to live in a foster home, but in many ways still too young to take on the responsibility of taking care of themselves. And I, I remember well when I was housing commissioner in New York City, we did a study of the children aging out of our foster care system. Fully a third ended up in our homeless system within just a few years. The sad truth as well is that not every runaway youth can return home. As one of our champions, Saul Flores, has seen at Chicago's Solid Ground Supportive Housing Program, many have fled violent home lives. Others, as champions Paul Heyman and Carl Siciliano understand so well, have parents that just can't accept their sexual orientation or gender identity. In fact, some studies show that as many as 40% of homeless youth are LGBT. Supporting efforts like theirs is one reason I'm proud we expanded our definition of homelessness to include unaccompanied youth up to 24 years old through the Hearth Act President Obama signed into law and that we passed with the help of our congressional champions of change that are here today. This will allow more young people who can't return home, return home to qualify for assistance under federal housing and homelessness programs and get the stable housing they need to become healthy, productive adults. But perhaps the most important legacy of the Hearth Act is that it enhances the full spectrum of housing and services that champions like Steve Busey and Sparky Harlan have proven we need to end homelessness among young people. In fact, within the next few days, I'm proud to say that we'll be posting the new Continuum of Care program regulation on HUD's website. Combined with our new Emergency Solutions Grant program, this will bring that holistic approach to the federal level, providing a new continuum of interventions from outreach, emergency shelter, and rapid rehousing to transitional and permanent supportive housing. Collectively, these efforts will give communities the flexibility they need to all be champions of change when it comes to confronting homelessness. But the truth is that as far as we've come, when it comes to homeless youth, to understanding who's homeless and why, all too often, we're still in the dark. That's why you've seen champions like Sherilyn Adams put a premium on data and research. We are as well. In fact, we will soon be encouraging communities to add a specific youth component to their annual point in time counts. And we're planning to publish this guidance in time to be able to incorporate it into next January's count to give us a clearer picture of homelessness, that clearer picture that we need. Another key tool to better understanding the challenge of homeless youth is the national study of homeless families that HUD is conducting. The single largest homelessness study we've ever done, this effort will compare homeless families with children living in rapid rehousing, transitional, and permanent housing. Not only will this help us better understand the dynamics of families that face homelessness, it'll also provide critical insights into what works, what doesn't, and what we need to do better. This audience understands that homelessness is also bigger than any one federal agency. As chair of the Interagency Council, my friend and colleague, Secretary Sebelius, has made fighting youth homelessness an absolute priority. With her partnership, our agencies are exploring ways to align HHS's runaway and homeless youth program with HUD's data standards on homelessness. Now, integrating databases may not sound like change that you can believe in, <laughs> but in the sphere of government, particularly the federal government, matching data from two large agencies like HUD and HHS, compiled by countless programs and IT systems, some of which date back to the Commodore 64. Anybody remember the Commodore 64? This is really nothing short of revolutionary. Not only does it help HUD's targeted programs work better with our partners at HHS, it also means champions 
like Lisa Stambolis, will be able to spend less time filling out paperwork and more time providing homeless youth with the targeted health services that they need. Most important of all, it means that we'll be able to provide assistance faster and more effectively because it will recognize the unique circumstances that face every young person living on our streets. Ultimately, they're the ones who these efforts are about. The boys and girls and young men and women who instead of looking ahead to all that life has to offer, my oldest son just turned 13, and I think about all that he has ahead of him. But instead of what he's got ahead of him, what every young person should have ahead of them, these children are just looking for a place to live. That's not right, and it should never happen in America. I'm proud. <laughs> I'm very proud of the important progress we've made toward ensuring it never does happen again, toward realizing opening doors goal of ending family and youth homelessness by 2020. And I'm convinced that we can meet that goal, not because of my commitment or President Obama's, but because of yours. From the community partnerships champion Deborah Shore has forged here in Washington, D.C., to the grants Trisha and Jeff Reikis have made to lift up communities across the country, each of you has reminded us that change never comes from the top down. It comes from the bottom up. It comes from men and women in communities around the country who believe that we can give every American, no matter their circumstances, the opportunity to reach their full potential. And that we can have the courage and conviction to prove it. That's why your friends, families, neighbors, and coworkers nominated these 13 great Americans to be champions of change. It's why they're here in Washington today. And it's why I'm so proud to be your partner and a part of this celebration of the extraordinary work that you do every day. Thank you, and with that, Let's get on to the champions. Barbara. Well, thank you, Secretary Donovan. Again, your leadership and support and the taking the time to be with us today is very much appreciated. I also want to um, thank um, Representative Spencer Bacchus for taking out time of his schedule and joining us. So let's please thank him um, for being here with us today. And now I get to introduce the champions and give you a little bit of why we selected them to be honored today. Uh, first, I want to introduce Sherilyn Adams. She is the Executive Director of Larkin Street Youth Services, which is internationally recognized for providing innovative housing, medical, social, and educational services to youth experiencing homelessness in San Francisco. Under Sherilyn's leadership, Larkin Street pledged to double the number of transitional housing beds in five years, and she accomplished that ambitious goal in less than half the time. We're also joined by Steve Busey, who after serving in the Marine Corps, began a now 40-year career working with youth. He is the Director of Housing and Homelessness for Youth and Family at LifeWorks Alliance in Austin, Texas, and has been a pioneer in developing a strong network of service and advocacy partnerships for LifeWorks especially enhancing service delivery for youth. Sparky Harlan is the executive director and CEO of the Bill Wilson Center in Santa Clara, California. Sparky provides, promotes collaboration and partnership at every level of her work, which has led to innovative strategic engagement between local school districts and homeless service providers as a strategy for retooling the homeless crisis response system. Beth McCullough is the Homeless Education Liaison and Grant Coordinator for Adrian Public Schools in southeastern Michigan. Her tireless efforts on behalf of children and youth experiencing homelessness have raised community awareness and helped to create a district-wide collaboration, the Road to Graduation Program, which identifies, enrolls, and ensures the academic success of homeless students. 
Lisa Stambolis is the Director of Pediatrics at the Baltimore Healthcare for the Homeless, where she oversees a staff <laughs> dedicated to conducting outreach and providing primary care to children and youth living in shelters and on the street. Nurse Lisa, as she is known by staff and clients, has helped create an innovative primary care clinic for homeless children. And she was instrumental in helping get unaccompanied youth in her state the right to consent to their own medical treatment. Deborah Shore is the founder and executive director of Sasha Bruce Youth Work in Washington, DC. Through her vision, she has developed innovative, culturally competent outreach, shelter, and transitional living programs to address the immediate needs of youth experiencing homelessness. She played a key role in the legislation creating the Federal Runaway and Homeless Youth Act in 1977. I understand she was in kindergarten at the time. <laughs> Deborah is also chair of the National Network for Youth. Timothy Bach is the executive vice president of Pathfinders Milwaukee. Tim has been a driving force in building comprehensive runaway and homeless youth services. Under his leadership, Path Pathfinders has added two new programs, the Milwaukee Youth Outreach Drop-In Center and the Q-Block LGBT Young Adults Housing Initiative. Frank Cirillo is the Director of Welfare for Mercer County Board of Social Services in Trenton, New Jersey. Frank championed a new housing and services model that utilizes targeted and mainstream systems to rapidly rehouse families experiencing homelessness. Frank is committed to ending homelessness for all families. Saleh Flores is the founding executive director of Chicago's La Casa Norte, which concentrates its work with Latino youth and families who are homeless or at risk of homelessness. Under her leadership, La Casa Norte implemented the Solid Ground Supportive Housing Program, Chicago's first bilingual, male intentional supportive housing program for homeless youth aged 16 to 21. Paul Haman is the president and CEO of the Knight Ministry, a Chicago-based nonprofit organization that provides housing, health care, and human connection to those who are struggling with poverty or homelessness. Paul helped to launch Chicago's only program that serves pregnant and parenting teen girls as young as 14 years old called Our Responsibility Pregnant and Parenting Program, or RAP. Margaret Schulke is the executive director of Project Community Connections based in Decatur, Georgia. Margaret helped to launch the DeKalb Kids Home Collaborative, which is a member organization of local partners who are organized across educational and homeless programs to provide education, housing, and employment services to children and families in DeKalb County School District. Teresa Rakus is the co-founder of the Rakus Foundation, which provides opportunities and support to help young people become healthy, healthy contributing adults. From day one, Tricia was determined to push other philanthropists and policymakers to look for a system-wide approach to address youth homelessness. Her vision has helped to shape the Rakus Foundation core grant-making strategies. It's focused on programs that prevent and end youth as well as young adult homelessness. Carl Siciliano is the founder and executive director of the Ali Forney Center. He has been a pioneer in creating a vision that LGBTQ youth deserve and benefit from LGBT specific services. His commitment to diversity and inclusion has guided the development of the most comprehensive, clinically focused, holistic model of care for LGBTQ youth in the country. You can see we have an amazing group of leaders who are joining us here today. And now, let's get a chance to hear from our champions as they can talk about their work and get our first panel started. So at this time, I'm going to ask the second panel to sit down with me and turn it over to Secretary Donovan. So Barbara just uh, gave us a great overview of some of the work that you do. But the truth is, uh, nobody can tell your own stories the way you can. And I'd love if each of you could just quickly uh, talk a little bit about the challenges that you see for homeless youth uh, in your communities, in your work every day, and what you think it is that you're doing that's most important to be a champion of change. And uh, why don't we start here? Deborah. 
Well, thank you very much. And one of the things before starting about my history and what I see is to thank you and to thank the USICH for the leadership that has, has been shown and HHS and the other partners because for the first time in the 40 some years that I've been involved, we're talking about ending youth homelessness, not just alleviating it. So I'm very proud to be here and I'm very happy to be a champion. Um, what, what we're seeing every day are an increasing number of young people who um, have needs that um, go beyond our capacity. Um, but however, the services and the responses that we have are proving very effective. So to the extent that we're able to provide um, the service to young people, we're seeing the result of that being that we are really turning around young people's lives. And the way that I think that we do that is um, because we have developed a range of services that have been responsive to the field, we are providing preventative services so that we're helping young people to get back to strengthen families whenever possible. We're providing street outreach so that we're getting out there to young people who are really at risk um, on the streets. We're um, providing an array of services um, that are longer term living because as you say, um, there are some young people even, without, even with all of the work that we do that can't go back home. So I think that you know, what, we, what we're seeing is the deepening of some of the problems um, but the hope and the aspiration is that because we have so many of the answers, we have some of the answers, and at least, um, there is hope that um, with, a, with more strategic thinking and um, work and collaboration, um, you know, I would see a much strengthened service system um, being in place that that could really make a huge difference and I think you know uh, I think that we all you know hope for that and for these particular populations of young people that we're seeing in such a large number that that are having particular problems Great. Sparky well Debbie and I go back 40 years so <laughs> when we were walking the halls here and it's great to see this kind of change um, I started out in San Francisco and moved to San Jose in Silicon Valley to run Bill Wilson Center 30 years ago. And it's a community that people don't expect to see homeless youth. It's very invisible. You have really the haves and the have nots with the tech engine that's really driving the community, but then low wage earners that are becoming homeless. What we're seeing at Bill Wilson Center, we have the same continuum. But what's different now about the homeless youth population is it's generational. They're coming from homeless families. So when we decided to look at, at ending youth homelessness, we're combining it with ending youth and family homelessness. Not an easy piece to take on. Because the youth piece we kind of own in Silicon Valley, but the family piece, you're talking domestic violence, all kinds of different providers. And there's a lot of competition for the limited funds. So it's like how can we drop that and really get together to look at what the issue is. And with homeless families, if I have a homeless child, I need to get home. And the parents are homeless, and there's drug addiction going on. Maybe one parent is in jail. I need to work with that family in order to reunite that child with that family. And what we're finding after 30 years in working with homeless youth, the best outcome oftentimes is bringing that family back together. We can do transitional housing and the rest, but we have to have help it generationally. So we now have a permanent housing site, and we're not only housing the homeless youth, we're housing the parent, we're housing an uncle oftentimes, a grandparent, so we're doing the whole continuum. And about a third of our kids now are coming from homeless families. Hmm. So that's uh, the difference in Silicon Valley. Great. Thank you. Paul? Great, thank you, Mr. Secretary, and I'd certainly like uh, to thank the White House and the Interagency Council on Homelessness for this. Uh, for putting this event on and for this honor. Uh, when I think about the youth that we see at the Knight Ministry in, in Chicago, I think one of the greatest challenges we have is the greater complexity of needs that youth arrive at our shelter doors with these days. Um, not only is it the fact that you're homeless, but there are usually mental, illness, uh, mental health issues that accompany the youth. 
Um, sometimes if the um, state foster care system has been involved or needs to be involved, uh, that's an additional challenge. So I think that the needs of the youth have become even more complex. And I think that one of the reasons why we've been so successful at the Knight Ministry, and we also have a continuum of street outreach to emergency overnight for GLBT youth, to um, interim programs for 120-day parenting and pregnant girls, uh, all the way up to two-year transitional living programs, is that we understand the need that youth are not just miniature adults. Uh, you cannot treat them the same way you do, you treat an adult homeless person. Um, that we do a really great job, I think, and I wanna tip my hat off to Carol Mills, who's in the audience today, who oversees several of our shelter programs. Carol has a really great way of saying that you've gotta be able to provide uh, mental um, shelter services in an age-appropriate context. So although you have a very structured shelter program, and you realize a youth is having a bad day and maybe mouths off to one of your staff members. Well, you know, that's just what adolescents do, you know? I could testify they, to that. <laughs> they, they, they push the limits. They're in a strange environment to begin with. So not only do they have all the stuff around being homeless, but they've got stuff about being an adolescent on top of it, you know? And that's never easy when you're housed, let alone when you're not housed. So I think that um, that just adds to the complexity of the need that we see and to be able to have a staff and volunteers that really understand that and be able to put those services in an age-appropriate context is really one of the reasons why I think youth find us, uh, find our services um, very open to them and their willingness to come to us and, and to be housed and to kind of start to examine the issues that have led to their homelessness. So um, I, I think it seems like such a very basic thing to do, but so oftentimes we find ourselves working in a very adult-oriented system and it's necessary to remember that, hey, not only are these youth homeless, but you know, they're still kids at the same time. And uh, if you can remember that, I think that's really, it's really very helpful. Great. Tricia. Well, I am humbled to be among such extraordinary colleagues. And um, I'm also very honored to be here to really represent a coalition of extraordinary organizations out in the greater Seattle area that are working hard on preventing and ending youth and young adult homelessness. Seattle, of course, is a great place to live. It's the home of some of the most innovative companies in the world with our high-tech sector, our biotech sector, um, and yet we have hundreds of kids unaccompanied on the street every night and up to 10,000 in the King County area alone in a given year. We have some extraordinary providers uh, that do a great job with wraparound services. In fact, uh, Youth Care is represented here today by the Executive Director, Melinda Giovengo. But and even though we spend $7 million a year, it's, it just hasn't been enough. So we really felt like we had to take a look at the problem in a different way. So the Rakes organization um, got together last fall with over 100 different stakeholders, private and public funders, organizations and agencies, to really take a look, and also Youth Voice, to really take a look at how we could tackle this problem in a different way. And what we have come out with is really a roadmap. We call the roadmap our priority uh, action steps for preventing and ending youth and young adult homelessness. It's not a comprehensive plan, but we feel it'll be the sort of three cornerstones to a systemic solution in our region to really tackle youth homelessness. It first and foremost uh, focuses on preventing, uh, on prevention and early intervention. Secondly, we are working on establishing coordinated engagement so we can systematically assess youth's needs and make sure that they're right matched with services and housing interventions. And then thirdly, it's about data. It's about really integrating, collecting data, integrating it, and being able to report it so we can really understand, we can size and scope our problem, we can understand what's working, what's not working, and we can measure it. So for us, um, it's really um, a very important start that will lead into some of the comprehensive needs that we will have in phase two around uh, affordable housing and additional services. Great. Thank you. Shirley. Uh, so I think, uh, I too am uh, deeply honored to be here and um, really wanna thank uh, you and Barbara and Jennifer and everybody for their leadership and really trying to move the needle on impacting and changing and ending youth homelessness. Um, like most of the folks up here and on the, the honorees, we have a continuum of services. I think what we've really been focused on at Larkin Street and in San Francisco is really trying to continue to better understand what are the drivers towards the actual outcomes that we want to see. So youth, ending youth homelessness is as much about getting folks off the street as making sure that they have the right sets of skills 
skills they need to transition successfully um, into independence and that we can measure that, we can know that, and we can know that we're really moving the needle on improving their educational opportunities, on improving their employment skills, as well as on just um, making sure they exit into housing stability. So toward that goal, we've really focused deeply on looking at um, what kinds of educational supports we need to provide to young people so that they can, um, one year post-exit from Larkin Street, be able to have moved along into their post-secondary education that they will be on a career path for a family sustaining income in their future and that they have the tools they need to live um, independently and to make sure that we have the data and we know what we're doing is working and that we're changing what we're not doing um, well so that we can improve outcomes towards the, toward, toward the goal of ending youth homelessness in San Francisco. Great. Steve? Um, Yep, I'm honored to. Thank you. But I want to. <laughs> but I want to say uh, to the 170 plus folks at LifeWorks in Austin, Texas, uh, you made this happen for me. So thank you very much. Um, I think uh, Paul started to take some of my thunder away. I think that's the what we do with youth. Uh, it's uh, they're not complete yet. You know, like my wife would say, Steve, you're not complete yet either. <laughs> but when it comes to youth, to the development, and so approaching it as youth-oriented services and developing those continuums that so many of us have because today may not be the right day for you, you know, but tomorrow might be, the next day might be, and there's a circle. It doesn't work here. Let's, let's come back over here. Let's regroup. Don't give up. It's the idea and the approach is, is that these folks need cheerleaders, they need people to care for them, and uh, most of all, I think that they, uh, we just have to care for them, because once you feel cared for, you want to start caring for others, and I think that's our approach. And remember, people aren't the problem, the problem is the problem. Thank you. <laughs> Lisa. Hi, thank you. I'm also very honored, and I, I feel like I am so lucky to work at Healthcare for the Homeless. It's a fabulous agency which allows me to do the work that I do, and so I'm taking one for the team. Um, I can really talk about what I know, and what I know was after working with youth for 20 years, I came to Healthcare for the Homeless, and um, nobody was taking care of the needs of homeless teens. They were just falling through the cracks. And I had worked at an inner city high school for many, many years. And so I really thought I knew teens and what was going on in their life. But what I wasn't prepared for were the amount of young people that I was seeing in Baltimore who were dropping out in ninth grade. That's the young people I was seeing. And so they didn't have any safety net. Nobody was taking care of their basic needs. So um, Healthcare for the Homeless built a brand new pediatric and adolescent clinic in 2010 and charged me with um, creating a clinic for them. And so what we've done is developed an outreach and clinic model. So there's three nurse practitioners, myself as one, and a social worker, and we go out to the different shelters and see teens where they are, on the street, soup kitchens, shelters. And then we see them back at our primary care clinic where we then can provide a full array of preventative services, their vaccines, their blood work, whatever they need, whatever they haven't been getting. And it's been hugely successful. We build relationships, and that's part of it. Um, young people don't just walk into a clinic. We have to go out and see them and meet them. And so I think that the outreach clinic model is just a, a really good model, and it works well for us in Baltimore City. One of the things that we found right away, though, was that we weren't going to be able to serve many of the young people we saw because of the law in Maryland at the time um, prevented them from consenting to their own medical treatment, right? So I went to our health policy folks and like, you know, we have this great clinic and we can do outreach, but we can only do so much medical outreach. We can't really give them, you know, the asthma inhaler for their asthma or all the other things. So we spent the next couple of years working with our other partners in um, Maryland and taking youth to Annapolis and testifying on behalf of the needs. And I'm very, very proud to say that this year, um, the governor signed into law in May a bill that will be effective in October that will allow minors in the state of Maryland who are unaccompanied to consent to their own medical treatment. And so that's just huge. <laughs> Um, 
I'd love to be able to get at least one more question each in, in uh, for each of you. So we'll try and uh, move through this. Deborah, I want to start with you. Um, the Sasha, Sasha Bruce Youth Work uh, Organization is the largest and most experienced uh, provider of youth services here in D.C. And, and we started to talk about in the first responses, you know, a little bit of the sense of the complexity of the issues, mm -hmm. how that complexity has grown over time. And one of the obvious things that leads to, which you've become an expert in, is that this requires more than any single organization. It requires real partnership. And I wonder if you could just talk briefly about the key partnerships uh, for you and how you've built those. Yes, I'd, I'd be happy to do that. You know, I think that, um, you know, this, the, the notion that this is a community-wide effort is, is essential. Um, and I think that in the places where, in, in my own experience and in D.C., where we have done a good job of creating partnerships um, where we can move young people um, into services that they need and throughout and make sure that they're not falling through the cracks, it works so much better. And I think that there are places in the country that have really um, shown some some great leadership there and have, have you know, a lot of, and I, I'm really happy to hear that there's more coming in this way because I'm convinced that to the extent that we're doing this as a community, you know, it makes all of the difference. Um, so, you know, I would say that we um, make every effort to link with the key um, players in young people's lives, the schools, um, the health clinics, um, the police, um, and you know any of the other agencies really um, that are providing those services. And sometimes I would say that's working very well, um, but there are other ways in which we can't always access all of those services. Um, so there, there's work to be done there. Um, you know, I would say, however, that you know as as an agency, what we have tried to do is to create the um, a way of providing the services that we are particularly good at, developing the relationships, working with families, working with young people in a manner that, we're, that, that is empowering to them, that is helping them to have a sense of self-agency um, and those things. And that really helps to then be, have, have a young person or us in a position where we can then get the other services that they need. So I think it, it works very well. Uh, Nurse Lisa, let's talk about one of those specific services. Sure. You, you just gave a great and inspiring example of one of the many barriers that these kids, these youth face in accessing health care. Uh, but there are many others as well. And I wanted to know if you could, uh, wanted to ask you to talk a little bit more about this clinic outreach model what it is, what drove you to start it, what's, what's particular about it? Because I think it really is something that we could all learn a lot from. Well, sure, because, and I'm also just really proud of it and I really believe in it. Um, you should be. <laughs> well, um, so I don't know what it's like in other states, maybe. In Oregon, you, you can find homeless youth. In Baltimore City, homeless youth are not, you know, hanging out on the street. Many are doubled up, many are moving around. They're not easy to locate. Um, there's very few beds for them. So outreach means we are taking medical care and we are in social work care and just meeting the young person wherever they are. And so that's what we do. We roll up our sleeves three days a week. Well, I specifically and everyone on my team, we each have a set schedule. We go to different shelters. One day I go to a youth shelter. The next day I go to an emergency family shelter. And the next day I go to a domestic violence shelter. And the, if I meet a young person there or a child that um, needs more comprehensive primary care, I can identify that and then refer them back to myself or a colleague. So I'm seeing them where they are. I'm seeing them on their car cot. I'm seeing them on the street. And then I'm also seeing them in the clinic. And what's happening there is what everybody here is already talking about, which is relationship building. So we're building relationships. We're building trust. They see me different places. They see my colleagues different places. Some of those places are around advocacy issues. Some of them are in coalitions. So it's very widespread. It's not just about that particular healthcare need at that moment. Great. Um, Paul, let me come to you uh, 
on this subject of trust building because it is so important. The Knight Ministry has uh, some very unique ways of doing outreach as well. A health outreach bus that offers medical exams, treatment and HIV testing, coffee, uh, conversation, <laughs> a sense of community. Um, you, do out you have outreach teams, a whole range of, of approaches. Um, so could you talk a little bit about engaging and uh, building that trust with youth? Yeah, I, I think most of it for us, um, it starts at a corporate level and a corporate commitment to really uh, accepting people for who they are and where they're at in their lives with no questions asked. Um, going to the relationship piece that Lisa was talking about, uh, you cannot expect somebody to, to, to trust a service provider if you're going to be sitting there having questions for them or an agenda for them. It's all about providing those questions, those services without being asked. So for example, if a youth shows up at one of our sheltered shelters in the middle of the night and we have a bed available, we don't stand there and make them answer 20 questions before we allow them in. We say, come on in, get settled, get a good night's sleep, and we'll start asking questions the next day about what needs to be done. So it's the, having literally that very low threshold uh, barrier of services. It's about creating um, environments that youth want to be around that are accepting and friendly to them. For example, our, our youth outreach van that's on the street uh, and the Lakeview and Rogers Park neighborhoods of Chicago uh, proudly flies the rainbow flag every night it goes out. And we've got queer friendly staff. We've got, you know, you name it, we've got it at the night ministry. Uh, and I think that that sets a really good, open and accepting environment for youth that they can tap into because they know that they can feel safe. And that starts to build the trust. And only after you've done that can you really start to work um, along the road to getting more different types of services or seeing what they need to be safe for that particular night? So for us, it really is a, a true corporate commitment to just accepting people as they are, no questions asked. I mean, you name it, we've got it, we work with them. We've got your working for us. Uh, and it really just makes a wonderful environment, but people pick up on that and they know they can come to us and, be, and that we will, they can trust us and we can trust them. That's great. Uh, Tricia, you know, We've talked about the complexity of bringing together these various services. I think thanks to our, our partners in Congress, we're hopefully getting better uh, at bringing together the federal, making them flexible enough to work with the state and other resources. But we're not quite there yet on uh, you know aligning these perfectly. And I wonder if you would just talk a little bit about the vision that uh, you and your husband Jeff had in creating this organization, what the niche was you were trying to fill, what the glue was that you were trying to provide uh, in this, and why in particular you, you focused on children in the middle years. Right. So we're shifting gears here a little bit. A little um, bit. <laughs> so I, I think really our, our mission and passion at the Rakes Foundation is really to help young people uh, achieve their full potential. And that is through helping them build the skills that they will need to be successful in school, career, and to be healthy, productive citizens. So that is sort of our overarching um, mission for the Rakes Foundation. Um, we're particularly interested in the middle school years. Of course, we're parents of three children ourselves, so we know exactly um, what you're experiencing <laughs> with having a, a middle schooler in your house. Um, we really are committed to helping uh, youth build agency, to really build those uh, non-cognitive skills that we believe are really critical for young people to succeed in this day and age. So that is really our driving force. Um, we bring that work also to um, our work on youth homelessness because um, the young people out there, I think uh, as referred to, they really need to be cared for. They all deserve to have uh, a voice. And so we believe in that in our region and we've been very lucky. Uh, Seattle has really had an appetite for uh, addressing homelessness in general. We've done quite a bit of work around chronic homelessness, family homelessness, and youth homelessness uh, is sort of that last segment that, um, uh, that we really want to bring to bear. And we've been very lucky in organizing all of our public-private partners, um, as well as the agencies and many organizations in our region to, to come together. And so we're very excited and optimistic. That's great. Um, I wanted to ask Steve and Sparky uh, together, uh, both, <laughs> both, yeah, both at LifeWorks um, Life. and at the Bill Wilson Center. They're older. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> They're actually going to do a shtick here. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. I know. <laughs> uh, 
but but you both are engaged in a way of doing uh, a range of different kinds of housing interventions. And I th certainly think, broadly speaking, in homelessness, we've learned uh, that you can't take a one-size-fits-all approach, particularly important for youth. And I wonder if you talk a little bit about how the various uh, pieces of that puzzle fit together for you in terms of the housing, the range of housing services that you provide, whether it may be transitional or permanent, et cetera, uh, how those work. I'll defer to you, young woman. Oh, <laughs> good. Thank you. Uh, one of the things I wanted to mention, I first a shout out to my teenager, <coughs> Javier, uh, who was very excited about me being here too, he was 17. Uh, so I learned a lot about adolescence through him. I'll be stopping uh, you for advice later, <laughs> my 13 year old. And we were looking at juvenile justice population. A, a lot of, we all talk about least restrictive setting. You don't want to keep a kid in juvenile hall too long because it's harder and harder to reach them. And a lot of kids were staying in our juvenile hall because they had nowhere else to go. The family didn't want them. What we needed to do is though all our funding sources, and this is where you were talking about your federal departments, have changed some. But the Runaway and Homeless Youth Act used to say, don't deal with foster care kids and don't deal with juvenile justice kids. So every time we dealt with one, they go, no, 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 you can't do it with our funding. <laughs> HUD started out saying, don't treat a kid that has any connection to foster care because it won't be allowed. Now you've really lessened that. And one of the things we learned is well, how could we access federal funds um, for a different, this population. So we looked at this program, Multidimensional Treatment Foster Care, a best practice out of Oregon, that basically looks at taking foster care, AFDC foster care, and also Medi Medi-Cal, which is Medi-Cal, Medicaid, and bundles that funding to help these kids in foster care and then reunite with their families. And we've been doing that program and reducing the population in our, in our juvenile hall. Now everybody knows I'm one of these advocates who just pounds at the door and says, take these kids out, we don't want them in juvenile hall. Um, but once I said, and we have this option for you that's a best practice, they said, sure, we'll do that. It's not costing us any money. Um, and so suddenly we're reducing the population by 50% and helping reunite these families in this foster care program that lasts eight months and basically does this intensive treatment to get the kid back home. And it's very successful and it's something normally we don't do. We have different types of programs, but it's how can we take these departments and access that money for our kids. One of the things I am concerned about long term is how the Affordable Care Act it's going to impact our homeless populations. And so that's one of the things we're trying to figure out is where do we fit in that picture? Um, and I'm hoping that the Interagency Council can help us find out how do we fit in that new continuum because I think we're all excited about our kids having access to health care and their families, but we're not sure how we fit in. Yep. That's great. Yeah. Steve? Um, she's absolutely correct. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we've been looking uh, for a long time at, at youth as being in youth, uh, rather than being connected to juvenile justice, homelessness, the foster care system. So we've been lucky enough to, to view the, the kid. I mean, the true chronic homeless individual in this community, or any community, is the foster care kid who's been in 30 or 40 placements since he's 10 and he just turned 17. That's chronic homelessness at its height right there. And we've also, uh, but, but getting back those, those different funds, I mean, HPRP was fantastic. I mean, almost 40% of the 360-some families were, were, were on 24 and under. Um, the, uh, but those continuums, once again, of providing a place, a door that, this is the door, you, here's a door. Which door do you want to do? What do you want to do? Coming in that door and engage, engage, engage. And then we go, we have these other doors over here. So there's, there's group living, there's apartment living, there's HUD supportive housing. There's, um, you know, we're, we're lucky enough we're going to build a 45 unit apartment complex this year to serve uh, these young folks. But it's just constantly looking for the continuum. And then uh, one thing I want to say too is, and there's a, an attitude of give me one more bed. You know, I work with a lot of folks in communities, especially smaller communities, that look at us and go, wow, can we all have all that? No, probably not. But you know what? In your community, it's just like my community where there are people that care. Find those people, get one bed, you will get another. And just the last shout out to uh, the wonderful AmeriCorps that we have every year in our agency, can't live without them.
That's great. And uh, lastly, to Sherilyn, uh, your organization had a very interesting history. It started almost 30 years ago. A group of local business owners, church members, neighbors, concerned about the rising number of kids in a, in a particular neighborhood. Now you've grown into an organization that not only does many of the comprehensive services that we've heard about, but also has become a research and an advocacy organization. I wonder if you could tell us uh, why the decision to go that, uh, that way and why is it so important to you uh, that you would become uh, that kind of organization comprehensively? Uh, well, I think a lot of the credit goes to, to my prede predecessor, um, Ann Stanton, in the development of kind of the piece of research and, and advocacy that we do. But I think the continued, continued work we do, it is because of all the things that, that you've heard folks say, which is in order, it's really not the youth that are the problem. Frankly, the youth are really easy and great to work <laughs> with. They are not the problem. The problem is the systems. The problems are that we have, com the, re the, the reason that the Interagency Council exists is because the systems are really the barriers to young people accessing the services that they need. So Sparky and Steve have, um, and Deborah have spoken to ways um, that they have fought those systems or have used or manipulated or uh, <laughs> did whatever they did to make it work and that's what we wanted to do as well. And we also have a deep commitment to bettering what we do and changing what we do. And the only way that we can know what we're doing is to have good data. And the only way that we can change the system is to fight back with good data about what is effective, about showing what the barriers are, and about pointing folks in the right direction about how we're going to actually address the issues in a comprehensive, comprehensive manner across multiple systems or multiple agencies or multiple whatevers. Um, so that the young people's experience is when they walk in the door, they get what they need. And that's what we're all striving for. And I think that's what has driven our decision making about how we apply our resources. Yeah. That, that's great. And it's, uh, again, going back to my days starting volunteering in a homeless shelter in, in college, this is an issue where we've gone from a, sort, a certain sense of hopelessness about it to, I think, a sense that you know, a president can stand up and say, we're going to end homelessness mm -hmm. because of that data, because we know that these programs are working. And I would, again, say thank you to our, our uh, colleagues in Congress, our, our partners in Congress, who have been part of that on a bipartisan basis. I really do think we're showing that in a time when too few people have faith that we can do big things in this federal government, that we are actually changing the world. We are moving the needle that we can end homelessness and we can do it on a bipartisan basis. So thank you all. You're inspiring to me. I'm going to get up tomorrow morning uh, a little more excited, a little more determined to get this done and to end homelessness by 2020 for our youth. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Secretary Donovan and the first panel. And we're going to make a switch right now and welcome our second panel to the stage. So. Well, it is my pleasure to introduce the second panel, um, who will be uh, led by Brian Samuels. Brian is the Commissioner for the Administration of Children, Youth, and Families, and he will moderate this second panel. Commissioner Samuels provides leadership over both the child welfare system and the runaway and homeless youth programs. His passion for ensuring that every child and youth gets the love and support they deserve is complemented by his true commitment to better data, use of evidence, and prudent use of resources. Um, please join me in welcoming and thanking um, Commissioner Samuels for joining us. Um, thanks, Barb. And I, I just wanted to acknowledge um, the, the audience itself, right? I mean, I think you folks are here because this is an important issue and because of the people we're here today celebrating are really special people. Um, and so um, it's a unique opportunity to have folks in the room who really care about these issues and who are committed to supporting us as we try to move forward. I I've got to tell you my, my, my one little story about uh, homelessness was uh, when I was uh, uh, announced as the state child welfare director in Illinois back in 2003. Um, 
uh, I got to the job the first day and, you know, um, looked at the, uh, the deck of information they had to provide me. Uh, and on the top sheet, there was a, um, um, the, the basics of how many kids and where they are and, and, and all of that. And to, be, to imagine being responsible for, um, you know, 30,000 kids or so is a, a pretty awesome uh, uh, experience. Um, but the really frightening one uh, was that we had 600 kids that were on run. So uh, we weren't looking for one kid or five kids. We were um, out looking for um, 600 kids, uh, two of which we hadn't seen for two years. And so we made a, a commitment at that point um, that we were going to have a face-to-face -face encounter with every single one of them, and uh, we were going to do it in, in 60 days. And... Um, uh, we, didn't, we didn't quite meet the 60-day mark. Um, uh, some of these kids are really hard to find. We found a couple of them in jail, a couple of them in the hospital, uh, one had joined the Army. Um, um, but, um, uh, but, but we found them in about uh, 95 days. Uh, and uh, that was the longest 95 days of my life. And I was glad it was over. Um, but it, it's, uh, you know, it, was a, it was a real lesson. Um, in both um, um, the vulnerability that comes with being on run when you're uh, uh, in the foster care system. Um, but more importantly, um, uh, it was also a reminder when, when you give folks a task um, and it has a real meaning, there's a real um, uh, experience tied to it, um, that the professionals in the child welfare field or the runaway and homeless youth field um, they take their job seriously, and those folks went out and found those kids, uh, and uh, and that part of it was heartening. So uh, that that's my little in introduction uh, to you, and and uh, a little bit about the work that I've done. So, so I, we're going to start uh, this panel discussion in many respects in the same place that the last one started, which was um, really to give each of you a chance to articulate the challenges you see for the young people. Um, that you serve every day. And so we'll, we'll start on the left with Seoul and work our way around the table. Okay, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, my co-founding board member, my mentor, and my inspiration, Keith Decker, who's also in the room today um, with me. So uh, La Casa Norte was established 10 years ago um, in Chicago on the west side to service young people uh, experiencing homelessness, but also to service the underserved population of Latinos, both immigrants as well as first and second generation Latinos uh, that weren't necessarily being connected to the safety net resources that we had available. Um, we established the first um, uh, bilingual and male intentional housing program um, in the city uh, because we wanted the opportunity to create stronger fathers, brothers, sons, um, and citizens. Uh, and we knew in, in doing that in a, a project-based, um, trauma-informed, uh, harm reduction model setting, uh, that we, I used a lot of uh, terminology there, uh, that, that we could be most successful. Um, one of the other elements about our program that we felt was really important also was to be uh, culturally competent. And, and that doesn't just mean for Latinos, right? That means for youth, that means for African Americans, that means for poor folk, that means for folks who have different levels of socioeconomic and educational status levels. Um, so we felt that that, that, that was really important. Um, and then the, as we have developed programming over these last 10 years, um, we've constantly been listening to what our young people and families are telling us that they need, right? And, and partnering with them. We don't do for them, we do with them, as you've heard many of my colleagues say earlier. And so we, too, have been uh, developing this continuum of care of services. Where we have really put our focus in the last couple years and where we will continue to drive our focus is on um, the end of the continuum with long-term permanent supportive housing for chronically homeless youth and families with children. We believe that the opportunity to access long-term housing is gonna be critical uh, to ending homelessness uh, in this country. Great, Thank Great. You. thanks. Good afternoon, it's a pleasure to be here, and I too want to recognize my colleague who's taking a picture right now, Jimmy U. Evans, who's our uh, housing manager at Project Community Connections, Inc. Um, PCCI has been incorporated since 1998. We've been focusing on the what's now called rapid rehousing. We didn't call it rapid rehousing all those years ago. We just called it permanent housing placement. We work in partnership with about 40 um, some odd emergency transitional housing agencies in the metropolitan Atlanta area and help 
individuals who, and families who are experiencing homelessness get to permanent housing by providing the traditional services of housing locator services. We do a lot of advocacy work because many of our um, individuals and families that we are serving have criminal credit background issue uh, challenges, so we're working with the landlords in that regards on behalf of our consumers. We do provide some short-term rental subsidies, um, utility deposits, those kinds of things. This is not new to anybody. This is a program that obviously we're now finding is very cost effective. But the, I think the key to it is that we are realizing that we can't do this without our partners. I think some of the challenges, that was the original question, what That's are right. some of the challenges that we're saying? Well, first and foremost, there is no more HPRP money. So um, that was a big um, challenge for us to make an adjustment this year. So how do we get more creative in finding resources that are going to continue to supplement the work that we're doing? Um, some of the issues also, too, around the fact that we are finding non-traditional um, individuals who are experiencing homeless now, homelessness now because of the economy. As an example, we find more fathers with children. We find more intact families. Um, what is happening is that the services and the shelters aren't catching up as quickly to the population that we're serving. Um, so we're going to find more often families who are living in laundromats or in their cars or fathers with their children in abandoned buildings because they don't want to be separated from their children. Unfortunately, we have found oftentimes that we will at least temporarily have to split up the families and have the dad go to the, the men's shelter and the mom go to a women and children's shelter, and that's always heartbreaking. So unless we um, stay with those families throughout that transition, um, the system isn't set up necessarily to... Um, reunify them and bring them back together. So that's something that we're working on and I'll talk about later in terms of some of our partnerships and why it's so important to continue to hold folks' hands as they make their way through the process. Um, of course, the other big issue is um, household income. That's something that we were having to address and I know we'll get into that at some point too in looking at how we're bringing in non-traditional partners, not just housing providers, um, but other folks who are going to be dealing with the income piece of it so that if we get them into permanent housing, how can we make sure that they sustain themselves into permanent housing? Great. Thanks. Thank you. Carl? Thank you for allowing me to be here. Uh, it's a great honor. Uh, I also want to recognize my Deputy Executive Director of Operations, Mildred Ramos. Uh, she's sitting there looking like a movie star with the big sunglasses. Um, <laughs> And then I also want to acknowledge my nominator, an actual movie star, Ali Sheedy, who is here with her, her daughter, Rebecca. Um, so thank you all for being here with me. Uh, gosh, the challenges, there's so many, and it's hard to say it in a few words. Um, LGBT youth uh, face many challenges in our society. I think that there's been a growing awareness of, of the harm that happens to them because of bullying in their schools. I don't think that there's nearly enough awareness of the extent to which they are rejected by their families. Uh, but enormous numbers of LGBT youth are, are not able to live at home and are rejected by their families. And they're very often kicked out and often they flee because they find the, the environment so uh, oppressive. Uh, dealing with homophobia in their own homes. Then in the youth shelter system as it currently exists, I think that we have made some great strides in the last decade, but too many youth still are subjected to homophobia when they try to access youth shelter. Um, I'll, I'll never forget when I started doing this work, uh, I worked in a drop-in center and the first gay kid that I tried to get into the one shelter in New York City at the time came back the next day and said he'd never go back. And when I asked him why, he said that when he went to sleep in his dorm, with, there were 14 other kids in the dorm, and as three went to sleep, they gathered around him and urinated on him to show how much they hated having a gay kid in their dorm. And then the psychologist who they made him go to the following day told him that his problem was that he thought he was gay, and if he just stopped thinking he was gay, maybe he'd get along better in the program. So. You know, the, the inability to access care without having to face homophobia, both from your peers and from the providers at times, can, can be very, very difficult. Um, and then the this third issue that I face that I think we probably all share is just like an incredible gap between the need and the resources available to help the young people. Uh, in New York City, a census was done that found that there were 3,800 homeless youth and the, the scene the city and the state combined to provide about 250 beds, and then uh, through other funding streams, mostly federal, there are about an additional 100 beds. But that means that for every one, for every 10 homeless youth in New York, only one is able to get a bed. 
So, so the, you know, and then the brutal conditions that all of these kids face on the streets. Uh, you know, in New York City, the, the subway system is probably really the youth shelter mm -hmm. system more than any other place. Um, so, yeah, we, we have a lot of challenges to face. Great, great. Frank? I'm also honored to be here and um, feel really honored to be amongst so many of the, the uh, uh, private partners out in the community. For a lot of times, I, I represent uh, a good-sized bureaucracy uh, in the scheme of providing social services, or at least that's how it's traditionally thought of. And sometimes um, uh, bureaucracies such as mine as a Board of Social Services are thought of being the impediment instead of uh, the initiator of any, any kind of change. Uh, so I'm, I'm proud to be breaking down those kinds of uh, um, superficial uh, stereotypes uh, and, and proud to be part of my organization and blessed to have a staff uh, that truly cares and truly, truly gets it and wants to be real advocates for uh, the homeless and, and the, the challenge people in our community and um, doesn't just seek to be implementers of, um, of policy and regulation. Um, we don't look at ourselves as an uh, ineligibility organization, but an eligibility organization, and we'll try to do anything we can to, to make those regulations work on behalf of the families and, and have great partnerships and uh, are willing to do that within the community. I'd also like to thank um, a couple of my mentors and my nominators out there, to Herb Levine and Sharon McDonald who are here. Um, a piece of my family, my wife, and uh, my youngest son, Nick, who is um, 13. And if, uh, yeah, if you want to know how to uh, keep in touch with youth and, and understand um, uh, the needs of youth, um, have a child when you're up in age, and, and, and that'll fix you right up. That'll keep you respecting children and thinking like a kid. So that works. That worked extremely well. So we love that. So we thank uh, thank you all for that. Um, you know, our agency faces a, a lot of problems with regard to, to youth because we look at uh, the people we serve or the families we serve as a whole. Uh, one of the things that uh, I believe I'm here for is, is how we've been able to get those partnerships to address the whole family. Mm -hmm. And um, you, you can't address the whole family if you're just uh, looking at regulations that pertain to the adult. It's nice to want to get an adult into a job and pick themselves up by their own bootstraps, but sometimes you need a place to put the boots first. Mm -hmm. and, and with that comes their responsibilities to their family, to their children. So they're not separate and apart. The, they, those responsibilities and challenges faced by the adult are faced by the children. So if we have um, a, a good and decent, affordable, permanent housing is what we're striving to get. Uh, not moving a family and children from shelter to shelter or place to place uh, to make youth feel that they have a sense of community, that they are belong to that community, and that they uh, have a real value. Uh, so those are real challenges when you're facing uh, the issues facing homeless families. Um, if we can keep that together, and I, I draw upon the stories that my parents told me coming up through the Depression, um, they were on a program called Relief back then for short periods of time where work wasn't plentiful and you uh, had to rely on those things. And there, there were some stories, and they always kept, I don't know how, a, a bit of a sense of humor about the, some, some of the things. But when they really talked to you seriously about it, they said the one thing we could do is keep the family together and that everybody within that family, the, the young people had uh, some uh, responsibilities and, and they had... Uh, rights and, and their parents uh, were adamant about holding them together and providing the services. Um, these days, that, that's very hard to do, and, and we're seeing, like many people here said, non-traditional setups. So you have a lot of fathers who have their children at this point, and they face big challenges. And in one instance that comes to mind, I knew that the father need, needed um, medical daycare for his child, and that's why, uh, that was the big impediment about not getting a job. So if we just stuck to the, like, oh, wow, well, you didn't go get a job, and we're gonna send you through this series of, uh, of penalties, we would have never known that if my staff hadn't been working uh, and doing real case management with the family and addressing the needs of the children. So those are the kinds of challenges, I think, uh, that we, we all face collectively, but in a broader sense of dealing with the family and making sure the children are, are taken care of. Timothy. 
Um, like my colleagues here, I am incredibly honored and humbled uh, to be chosen as one of the champions of change. Um, and I accept this recognition on behalf of the organization I work for, and that's Pathfinders in Milwaukee. Um, it's an exceptionally dedicated group of staff, both paid and unpaid, and an amazing group of young people that we serve, and we've been doing that uh, for the last 40-some years. Um, you know, I think many of us have, have spoken already about uh, the complexity of the issues facing our young people, uh, the many challenges that they are struggling to overcome. Um, I could repeat sort of the concerns about the high degrees of um, alcohol and other drug abuse or mental health problems, the disproportionate impact of homelessness on LGBTQ identified young people, um, the difficulty many of our young people, especially our youth of color, are having in terms of getting, um, uh, getting employed, getting out of school successfully, um, getting their feet on the ground and trying to uh, get their lives moving forward. But I think overall for me in the work that I do, the biggest challenge always seems to come back to uh, the frustration over how many people in my community, uh, in my state, and I think in our country, who still don't understand that we even have a problem of youth homelessness to begin with. Um, and I think that's in part because of um, the protective factors that youth have developed, um, the resiliency that they're able to evidence, and the fact that they work very hard um, to belong and to fit in and to not stand out. And so, Ironically, they help contribute to the perception that there really isn't a problem to begin with. Um, I remember growing up, the last thing I wanted to do was stand out. I wanted to fit in. I wanted to look and act like everyone else. And so I think most of us can relate to that at some level and understand that um, for our young people, they don't want to be singled out. They don't want to be held to a stereotype of what it means to be homeless. But because we can't see them, as a visible part of our community, I think sometimes it's hard to get our arms around the extent of the problem and why we need to really marshal our resources and affect needed systems change to actually begin to make an effort that is successful toward ending youth homelessness. Um, and in that regard, we have a lot of work to do if we're gonna do it um, in the next eight years. Great. Um, Beth, can you give us some of the challenges young people face in your community? Um, I would like to say thank you to the White House and the Interagency Council on Homelessness for inviting education to the table. That's what I want to say. Thank you for inviting schools to the table. And I feel like I repeat that in my community often. Thank you for inviting. We have kids. We, we have the kids. Um, so I get very excited when I'm able to talk with housing people. Really what I've done in my community is just build those bridges. I, I work with you know um, shelters who say we can't get into the schools. They, they don't have time for us. We made an appointment and then something came up. And, and schools say, well, we don't know how to get into the shelters. They, they have confidentiality rules. And I say, no. No, I'll be the bridge, I'll be the bridge. We can do this. And, and what we have found in my community is when we make bridges between our education systems mm -hmm. and our shelter systems and housing systems and youth serving organizations, we end up with good graduation rates. Um, there's a, a collaborative effort that we put together um, called Roadmap to Graduation, like a foreign exchange student program. Yeah, but instead of taking in somebody from France, you take in a homeless youth and that was because we had schools and we had agencies working together um, the challenges are that these numbers are increasing so sometimes people don't want to look at the numbers that are in education and I find that kind of in many different states that I've had contacts in the US Department of Ed just released numbers on um, homeless students in our public schools for the 10-11 school year and we hit a million and I, and I say that with a wince, mm -hmm. that we have a million homeless kids in our public school system within one year. That doesn't include preschool, and it doesn't include the babies, and it doesn't include the mommies and daddies that might be attached to those families. So that increase in numbers is huge. The bridges that aren't yet built between the education system who has these kids, knows how to access these kids, can form safe places and ways for these kids to come forth and say, this is what's going on, or I can go into um, food pantries and soup kitchens and um, abandoned buildings to find these kids. And if I can get them housed, 
oh my goodness, they would like to come back to school. So mm. those bridges, I think, are extremely important. So I have to say thank you for inviting education to the table. The challenges are the lack of services, but also the lack of the bridge between the education community and housing and housing to education and the increase in numbers. Great. Thanks. So we don't have a ton of time left here, but I, I did want to do a quick round of questions just to give people a chance to accentuate some of the work that they're already doing. So, so could you take a, a second and talk a little bit about the diversity within the Hispanic populations that you serve and the, the, the role that culture may play uh, in successfully getting young people off the streets or um, the role that culture may play uh, as a barrier to getting young people to even come in and ask for the, the support that they need? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Beth, for being such a great bridge, too. <laughs> um, so one thing that we know um, certainly is that uh, in, in this country, Latinos are not a monolithic population. And so we have young people and families that are first generation, second generation, um, that don't speak Spanish anymore. And then we have recent immigrants who only speak Spanish. Um, and that there are there's a broad level of misconceptions about how Latinos access a safety net of resources in this country. Um, what we do know is that kinship networks don't always work. They're not always always successful and they're not always the appropriate placements. So we find uh, families and young people um, sleeping 10 people to an apartment, a studio apartment, or families sleeping with a three-year-old next to a boiler in a basement. Um, and that is inappropriate housing, right? Um, so we, we believe that uh, uh, it, it was important for us to help families and young people overcome um, fear, uh, shame, uh, and also just complete lack of knowledge around the types of safety net services available um, to all people in this country, but, but what is available to, to Latinos specifically. Um, we pride ourselves on providing um, bilingual and culturally competent services, like I said previously. And so just a couple of quick challenges around it are um, young people, particularly in our housing programs and families, don't always appreciate diversity themselves. <laughs> so we find ourselves from our own, uh, like, you know, Paul mentioned earlier, you know, where does it begin? It begins with your corporate culture and your core values as an organization and staff. And we're very open and accepting and we're all about celebration for all. And we run up against all the young people perpetrating the isms on each other. And so that was a huge lesson learned. We were like, oh, you know, kumbaya, we all get along. And no, we're, you know, we're every day negotiating um, black brown challenges um, and misconceptions around each other. Um, so, so that's a challenge, but uh, I think that we're doing a good job, and I think that we are um, helping build a stronger country of young people and families that are moving beyond tolerance and towards celebration. And as we think about what this country will look like in 2020 and in 2030, when we are all a uh, pretty shade of cafe au lait, <laughs> uh, the, these lessons learned will be very important. Thank you. Yeah, good. That's great, uh, Margaret. Can you can you take a, a, a shot at talking some about the, given the complexity uh, uh, that young people bring with them uh, to homelessness? Can you talk some about the role of uh, interdisciplinary work and uh, the role that? Uh, 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 memorandum of understandings play uh, in your service delivery strategy. Sure, that would be my pleasure. Um, back to the one million students, I think that it represented a 57 percent increase since the recession began. That's nationally and that's pretty much consistent with where we are. So when, when our group came together, there's four core agencies. Uh, Decatur Cooperative Ministry provides prevention, shelter, and transitional housing. Um, our South would do, does rapid rehousing, and originally at the table was the school systems. We work with the schools, have been, but in a more thoughtful way in the last couple of years, both because HUD's mandates require us to, but we also realized it was a smart way to go. So when we first started sitting down thinking about what do we do, we had this sort of boondoggle of resources through HPRP. We can do a lot more. How do we be really wise and thoughtful about this? We, we have the shelter. We, ha we can get folks into permanent housing. And then somebody kind of piped up, actually is one of the homeless school liaisons, and says, okay, but what, it, when, what about when you get them in, how are you going to keep them in? We realized that the missing piece for us, because we do work in silos, housing folks and school folks, and sometimes we leave out the piece that has to do with the income and the jobs. And it was brought to our attention. We said, we need to bring somebody else to the table. Fortunately, um, in our community, we have a good relationship uh, with a nonprofit called First Step 
they do two pieces, uh, working exclusively with the homeless community. One of them is that they do temp to perm jobs, um, so job placement agencies, working with um, for-profit employers, particularly in the hospitality industry and, and elsewhere. And they also work um, helping expedite the process of getting social security disability. We have a lot of both family, adults, and children who are needing to move quickly through that process. So they've been able to expedite that from two years to maybe down to six months. So when we realized this, we had the housing, all parts of the continuum from wherever you needed to start, whether that be at the emergency shelter or if you're ready to go into permanent housing. And now we had the income piece. How can we kind of slowly build on this collaborative and being mindful that the stimulus was time limited? We thought from the very beginning, how do we make sure that we institutionalize this so that we don't go away, that we're not here just because somebody tells us to or they're giving money for us to be here. We really wanted to be here because we realized very quickly it was very efficient for us to utilize our resources. We could each do a little bit of the, of the puzzle. So the first thing we started doing was, even though we all like each other and we still do, um, we realized we may not all of us be here, so how do we put this into some writing and setting expectations? So we were able to engage some pro bono attorneys who helped us with both a, a memorandum of under, understanding that sets up the services. You send me a referral, I'm obligated to send back some response to you within three to five business days. Um, so that everybody knows, and there's now this level of, of trust between the agencies that we're actually going to respond to you, that it's not gonna get stuck in a stack, but it doesn't also allow us to drop the ball, so to speak. Um, we also got into issues around fundraising because we're doing really well actually in private fundraising um, beyond public sector funding. There's a real interest and brings in new opportunities for funders who are interested on the education piece but see that there's a connection between educational outcomes and housing. So it's opened up this whole new world for us to go out and do fundraising jointly, but we don't wanna compete against ourselves. So we looked at those kinds of things. How do we look at our funding? How do we continue to sustain, sustain ourselves as a collaborative? So it's really important to have those key um, infrastructures and tools in place to make sure that we can, can, we're gonna continue beyond Margaret and Jimmy Yu or whoever happens to be sitting at the table. And what's been interesting is our small collaborative has started to uh, reach out amongst uh, beyond just the DeKalb County area, but looking at the Atlanta Public Schools and the Fulton County Schools, and how can we bring the schools, homeless liaisons, in, in a more intentional, thoughtful, and deliberate way into the continuums of care, and even have been speaking at a statewide level to talk about how do we replicate it. It's not really rocket science. It really is, frankly, just a matter of being deliberate, being possibilist, and saying, yes, we can do this, dis not despite, but with the restrictions that we have, but um, just committing to that. So, um, yeah. No, that's, that's, that's great. Thank you. C Carl, you, you had talked a little, bit, uh, a little bit in your introduction about some of the challenges that the LGBTQ youth bring with them to homelessness. Um, can, you, can you spend a little bit of time talking about um, what you think you do that's right for that population or, or said differently, um, what are the essential elements to serving that population equally well? Um, one of the wonderful things about the Ali Frenet Center is that because we're LGBT specific, it's one of the few spaces that these young people have in their lives where they can just relax and not feel like they have to defend themselves against homophobia and judgment. And I find that that is extremely therapeutic. Another aspect of what we do that I think is very important is that we're very intentional around the, the you know, creating smaller home-like environments for the young people. I think so many of the young people we work with are traumatized by the sense that they were cast out of their families and made to think that they didn't, that they weren't worthy of being in homes or in communities. So we really try very hard not to set up kind of institutional shelter-like models. And, and you know, most of our housing is in like three bedroom apartments mm. with, with staff supervision, you know, where they're very integrated into the community and don't stand out at all as homeless people. Um, so I believe that that's very important. Our kids are traumatized. I mean, they're badly traumatized, and we've been able to build in a lot of mental health services. Uh, we were really fortunate to get a grant from SAMHSA a year and a half ago that really helped us to ramp up our mental health services. And additionally, we've gotten some good funding from New York State that's enabled us to do that. So we've really been able to have all of our programs, you know, from our drop-in programs through our emergency and transitional housing be clinically infused. 
and that, that's been very important. And then I'd say the last element that's really important is so many of these young people don't see role models at all in terms of you know, what it means to be like a, a, a healthy, successful gay person or a lesbian sure. person or, or, or transgender person. And um, we've really prioritized building in like a, a we, we call it the life coaching program, but, but we build in like mentors who really commit to the program over a long period of time and, and partner in our different homes and, and show the youth that, that they're worthy of being cared about and loved even when they're not, staff aren't being paid to do it. Um, but, but also to kind of share with them how they as, as LGBT people were able to kind of overcome the homophobia that they experienced and build healthy lives for themselves. Right. And so I think bringing in you know, adults and mentoring capacities has been really important. Frank, you, you alluded to um, uh, working in a large organization. Um, and, and I'm just curious, um, could, could you spend just a, a moment talking about the, the, the evolution of serving homeless youth uh, and the work that it takes to have a large agency uh, evolve mm -hmm. as the service system evolves so that you can adequately uh, ad address the issues of the day. Sure. Well, first it helps to be around for over 40 years. You said that. And, 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 yeah, <laughs> and everybody, <laughs> I think it helps, and everybody thinks you're some oracle of wisdom because you've been around for, you know, for your longevity here. Um, but, but that does help. And, uh, the, the evolution of, of the agency uh, has really come about even through my successors. Mm -hmm. So I can't take full credit uh, for all of that, but um, it, it comes from constantly asking the question, um, are we doing enough? You know, are we doing enough and are we making a, a difference? And if you can answer those two questions, it goes uh, a long way in taking a giant step in moving your um, your organization forward. Next thing is to get them to, to think different. I remember one group coming in one time um, and, and some governmental entity saying, we think of you as uh, just a standard state kind of uh, organization. I said, well, we're not standard anything and we're not uh, just a normal anything. We, we really think we, we try to stay uh, a little bit ahead of the curve on those things. And we look at ourselves as very much part of the community effort uh, and, and with our private groups, developing those kinds of relationships that are important to uh, fully serve the family. So when you, you look at each other in that light, and then you make the effort to pull everybody at the table and say, look, are you willing to throw your chips into the middle of this table and, and really make a difference by bringing all, uh, your resources, your expertise, um, your agency takes on uh, and, and, and evolutionary uh, air about it. Uh, and um, you're able to sit at the table and, and talk uh, together as peers uh, to a common solution. I was talking to Steve Busey before uh, when we were sitting in the other room and we were saying, look, everybody wants to do the right thing in this, this thing. Nobody sitting around saying, we're gonna try to submarine a program or, or uh, provide bad services to the, to the youth here. But, but what we're saying is, you need to build those relationships. So if you have the will to do that, to change, mm -hmm. if you have the ability to reach out and, and go into the uh, other agencies and say, hey, what can we do for you? And then collectively, what can we do to serve the populations we need to serve? I think the, that, that kind of effort brings everybody to the table and, and makes you change, as well as the whole dynamic of providing services. Um, Timothy, you, you had uh, um, alluded to, um, um, yeah, I will. Um, so uh, I want to make sure these, <laughs> these two folks get, uh, get a chance to really put their stuff on the table, too. Uh, you know, you, you alluded to the, how, how young people, um, particularly those who are homeless, um, they're not interested in, st in, in standing out. They're not mm -hmm. interested in being uh, easy to be seen and, uh, and, and pointed out or, or stigmatized. Can, can you take uh, just two seconds and, and talk a little bit about then how do you overcome the challenges of reaching out to them and establishing that, that trusting communication mm -hmm. that ultimately uh, enables them to come in and, and seek the services and supports they need? Sure. Um, aware of the time, I can answer this very quickly. Um, ask young people. Ask them what they want. Ask them what they need. Um, be willing to listen. 
be willing to listen to what they have to say and then do something about it. Um, it's all about positive youth development. We developed a drop-in center after an exhaustive three to five year process of getting youth input. Tell us what you want. It's sort of that cliche of if you build it, they will come. Well, you have to know what you're building and the best people to tell us what to build are the young people themselves. Um, uh, so, uh, Beth, I, I was the I was the chief of staff at the Chicago Public Schools, and we had uh, we had twelve thousand homeless mm -hmm. youth uh, the last year I was there. And um, uh, y you know, in a school system where the primary responsibility is, is on teaching, reading, writing, and arithmetic, um, how do you make sure in a school system that the personnel have the sensitivity that they need? Um, to, be, to meet the unique needs of, uh, of the homeless population? Well, I have a great school system that I work with, and so they allow me to do trainings at the beginning of the year and so forth. And, and sometimes it's going to teachers individually and saying, I'm working with this student who's having this difficulty. What I need is for homework to be done at school because it can't be done at home because he doesn't know where home is today. So sometimes it's those individual situations. It's my wonderful lunch lady saying, by the way, this kid goes through the lunch line, takes all of his food, puts it in his backpack, and then starts asking other people for food. You might have, want to have a chat with him. So there are a lot of those kind of folks. It, it really comes from the fact that uh, the people in the education system can see that education is the ladder out of poverty. I have a number of kids that I worked with that were homeless five years ago that are now graduating from college and making twice what I do, so I'm in the wrong job. But <laughs> it tells me that education is the ladder out of poverty. And when those teachers get that, and my lunch ladies, and my bus drivers, and my superintendent, and my board of education see that, and the shelters see that, and we come together because we understand it is a big piece of the puzzle that it is the way that for this student, who's making twice what I am, it, it, they will not be homeless. They have a pretty good insurance plan against becoming homeless again. So it is part of ending homelessness. Great. Thank you. Uh, thanks to the panel. If everybody could give the panel a hand. Well, thank you, Commissioner Samuels, and a great panel, and uh, having everyone be with us. It's now my pleasure to introduce John Carson. He is the director of the Office of Public Engagement. They've been our, our great um, allies in having this uh, event here today, and I want to thank John and let him close out the program. Okay. Right. Good afternoon, everyone. Well, I will be brief. I wanted to close today with two simple asks. First, uh, that you all join me in a big thanks uh, to Barbara Poppy and the whole uh, U.S. Interagency on Homelessness for the help today and, and for everything you do. And my second ask is that as we leave today, you all help us tell this story, whether you're following along online, whether you're here in the audience, and most importantly, our champions of change. I'm asking you to blog about this, write about this, tweet about this. We're using hashtag WHChamps. If you don't know what a hashtag is, you should. Um, find three people in the grocery store to tell what you saw here today. Tell your own story. You wouldn't be watching online or you wouldn't be here in the audience today if you didn't care about child and youth homelessness as well. And I ask you to do this for two different reasons. First, we have some information to share here. We have some best practices, we have some inspiring stories. Some of you have probably maybe heard about a state, local, or federal program you hadn't heard of before or hadn't seen used in that way. We have information to share and all of you have a story to tell as well. But I have a second and I think more important reason for asking all of you uh, to tell this story. You know, we started this Champions of Change program because we knew as we were here fighting in Washington, D.C. over budgets and taxes and policies, there's thousands of people just like our champions who are making real change happen in their communities. And I think what we can all agree, no matter which side of those policy debates we're on, we can all agree we need more Americans who believe they can make a difference and are inspired, inspired to do so. And the stories of our champions today, when people hear about it, when they hear about it from someone they trust, from someone in a network like all of you are in, 
they'll be inspired to be a part of making change as well. So thank you for being here today. Please help us tell this story, hashtag WHChamps, and one more round of applause for our great champions today. Thanks so much, everyone.